And this, it's a slim book, and uh, basically in the introduction I say that it's more like a pamphlet than a, a treatise. So I, I was trying to look at the problem, like basically the problem is why Russia started this war. Uh, there is basically no, no, not much about the military uh, aspects of it. First, because uh, this is not my, my specialty, not really my, I mean, of course it's my inter interest as well, like anybody else's. But when I, I was writing it, the war was just at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, while it was kind of developing, I, was, I kept writing, and then I had to finish it, you know, quickly. And um, um, that's a wartime book. And actually, as I, as, I, as I say in the introduction, some of the, some of the greatest scholarship in humanities were uh, written during the wars, during the First World War, during the Second World War, and I'm sure there are great books that are being written you know, right now. So why, why Russia started this war, and what was the context? And, um, I, and it's, there was, in fact, the war started in 2014. So when I say that, so, so the, in, in February 22, that was the new stage of the war that started then, and um, we, do, we even don't have a name for this war. Say, Ukrainians really wanted to call this war the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, basically denying their own agency, which proved to be you know, decisive for the course of the war. There is an, another concept that I adopt, um, which also was, uh, so basically I created it for myself, uh, for this book, and then it was simultaneously used by Sergei Plohi in his really great book about the war, the uh, Russo-Ukrainian War, and I think that that is there. And the, the Russo-Ukrainian War that started in 2014 and is continuing, um, and we don't know when it will end. Okay, and I, of course, so. When I was writing this book, I, would tr I, would, I, I tried to imagine the future uh, reader of this book. Who will actually read? So the, the book will, be, you know, will go to the publication. The process will take time. Most probably, this is what I was, this is what I thought then. Most probably, the reader, uh, when will she be reading this book? The, 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 uh, will see the war finished. So the reader will read about this war in the past. And uh, therefore, uh, I wrote the whole book in the past tense. It's like in a historical past. Uh, let's see, like, like, Russia was like that. The war was like that. Putin was like that, whatever. Oil was like that. And uh, so I meant that uh, the war would become finished earlier than I hoped. And then, uh, not, but not only the war. So the book ends with a kind of uh, provocative, I think, uh, chapter about the, the like, actual decolonization, or I call it the federation of, of Russia. So my prediction that I formulated was that Russia will not survive the war that it started and will um, be disintegrated, be dismembered, basically. It will kind of collapse because of this war. And the historical metaphor that I used was also because I was starting my job here in Vienna exactly in the same moment. The historical metaphor was the Habsburg Empire that launched the war, uh, that it could not you know, s s stand, and uh, collapsed uh, as a result of its own war. And I, uh, of course, uh, this uh, optimistic prediction and the very past tense which organizes the book has not been 
confirmed. Right? There was still continues where you know people are reading this book. Um, so I, I guess that Anton will say that I was too optimistic when I was writing that. And I would ag agree with, with this criticism. But on the other hand, uh, no way in this book I set the date. I say it, it will happen. I say Ukraine will win. Uh, or no, that's not what I say. I say Ukraine, Ukraine won the war in the past tense. Uh, the Russian Federation collapsed in the past tense. So, but I didn't say when it happened. So, so the book really looks at the whole uh, issue from various perspectives. Uh, and I really thought that the, the problem, of course, is very complex. That's you know, very big country with, with, with many various problems. Uh, and uh, so there is a chapter on Russia as Petro state, chapter about parasitic governance, a particular style of governance, which is characteristic for Petro states, and I call it parasitic governance. And I introduce the concept of the parasitic state. That's the state that supports its attributes, but does not realize its functions. Um, there is a chapter about elite, the Russian elite, I, I call it the, the so-called elite, the ch a chapter about the public sphere, a chapter about gender and degeneration. So uh, in this chapter, I review all kind of demographic issues both fertility and mortality, and, but also gender. In very, I mean, you, you, you know most of that, but there is a very interesting gender disbalance between life expectancies of males and females, and I make quite, quite a lot of this particular fact. And um, probably you, you will be interested in it. I, I will be happy to re respond to the questions. <clears throat> there, is this, this, there is a chapter about the start of the war, basically, but the war ju had just started, so I relied, uh, I analyzed Putin's speeches that preceded the war and articles and that launched the war and uh, competent the war, basically, what, what kind of rhetoric and um, historical explanations and um, accusations accompanied these actions that led to genocide, rhetorics of genocide in, the, in, in real time, like basically, as it was developing. And the, and the, the final chapter, it's chapter eight, it's called Defederating Russia. R Russia is a Russian federation, and it goes all the way from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok, you know, also the Caucasus and the Urals. And and it has very particular geography, very particular demography, and very, very particular political economy. And it, I, and the, I, I see this federation as the last surviving empire. The Russian Empire historically was developing in a petition with and, and simultaneously with great world empires, starting from the Portuguese Empire, Spanish Empire, British Empire, French Empire, German Empire, Austrian Hungarian Empire, they all collapsed and uh, turned into nation states. All of them but the Russian Empire that changed its juridical shape from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union to the Russian Federation, lost parts of the ter ter territories, but still very minor part of the territories if to compare, say, with the territorial losses of the British Empire after the collapse of the empire. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of discussing, you know, how, how are these uh, uh, suc successor countries, or actually it's all in the past, where those successor countries, were they viable, how they would develop their statehood, what would be the conflicts between them, and how they would develop into new, beautiful, whatever, members of the global community. And that's a very optimistic end of a very, very sad story. 
But I should say that among all, all this, uh, chapter is probably the most kind of strategic and central is the first one called Moder Modernity in the Anthropocene, basically Russia against Modernity is the title and uh, I had to deal with this. That was my intuition from the start that Russia is fighting with Ukraine and also it is fighting against the whole big modern world. So the world is changing exactly in the direction that goes straight against the core existential Russian interests. Because Russia is a petro state, it and I and you know there is there is lots of political science and uh, social science speculations, anthropological speculations about the nature of petro state based on the experience of Venezuela or Iran uh, or Saudi Arabia and now, of course, uh, Russia. And I kind of summarize it and apply this cor corpus of knowledge to Russia, the Russian Federation, which gets basically its income, almost all of its income, from trading oil and gas. And the climate change, or rather climate action, and decarbonization that is now defined by whatever by the official decisions of the European Union and the United States and other developed countries would deprive the Russian Federation of its core uh, income. That's an existential threat. And that was perceived as such by the Russian elite and the Russian government and leadership. And indeed, the, this core benchmarks and deadlines and new schemes of border carbon trade and um, other such things were adopted by the European Commission exactly in 2021, exactly before this war started. So I introduced some kind of some new terms for dissecting, you know, what is modernity. I will not go uh, into that, I think, now. But if, if you are interested, uh, I would be happy to talk about, you know, how I understand this, how I, how I understand our modernity. There were different kinds of modernity. We live in a very particular moment. Before the war, we lived in, in a particular moment. Now it's, it has become even more particular. So Russia is fighting against modernity. Russia understands modernity, the advance of our new modernity as an existential threat. And Ukraine li lies exactly between the Russian Federation and the changing Europe, the changing modern world. So I don't really take uh, the idea that the, uh, in, like deep intrinsic anti-Ukrainian anti -Ukrainian sentiment uh, defined the war. I don't feel that there was like uh, that the Rus that, that there was anything like demand of the Russian people to start this war against Ukraine as Ukraine. Uh, this is Russia. This is the Russian war. This is not only Putin's war. That's for sure. Russia is you know, taking. Russia is mobil, mob, mobilizing uh, in all possible senses, uh, driven by propaganda and uh, and money um, to win this war. And um, and. Uh, we are still talking in the process when this war is continuing, how it will end. Is it thinkable that Russia will win this war? I honestly, frankly thought while I was writing that it is unthinkable. But now when, I mean, while we're reading the news, which we do, um, not so much from Russia, but from, uh, uh, from, from Ukraine and the West. 
This victory still sounds very unprobable to me, but but we are living in a very, very, very difficult turning point of this story. That's it. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, <clears throat> I will, I think, provide um, some... Uh, I will share with you my uh, own thoughts about the book, about the, um, about the um, uh, main arguments of the book. I will also share some, I think, some thoughts that were generated, or at least uh, that were contributed by, uh, by reading this book. I will start from saying that uh, you actually you gave me sort of a gift because you didn't mention uh, two major concepts that you, you are using in this book. It's a Gaia modernity and paleo modernity. In fact, uh, as you define those, as you, as you, um, uh, as you use these terms, uh, you could rename you know, Russia against modernity into paleo-modernity against Gaia modernity. Yeah? And Gaia modernity, as you, as you put it, uh, it is this new modernity where the concept, probably from the this, you know, post-materialist scale of values, uh, are important, and this is where I think the Putin system, or, uh, you, you write it as well, the Putin system has trouble uh, maybe even addressing. Yeah? Um, for example, how the uh, renewable energy became important, environment became important, you know, the concerns about climate change, all these things. And uh, it's not, I think it's not only that Russia sees that as an existential threat. I also think that it is maybe, not necessarily ideologically, but philosophically unprepared to address those issues. And this is, unfortunately, this is not only a trouble with Russia, in a way. We are, you know, liberal democracies and are facing so many, not necessarily threats, but challenges that even democracy, and probably even especially democracy, where debate and discussion are important, is very, very slow to address them. Uh, and, you know, the challenges are, of course, uh, uh, um, a huge range of them. But what, what democracy does in this situation, it tries to, through debate, through discussion, it tries to deal with those problems, find solutions, while Russia just stops them. So that does not exist. You know, that challenge does not exist. For example, how they deal, well, gradually, how they deal with, say, the uh, um, uh, gender issues. No, they simply don't exist. You are not allowed, basically, to talk about this. Uh, very recently, just a few days ago, you, you may know that uh, LGBT was, first it was declared to be an international movement, and then it was declared an extremist organization. So this simply does not exist. It's just extremists. We are not, we, we're not discussing anything with the extremists. Yeah? We are just you know, forbidding this. The same with, the, uh, with, say, disinformation for democracy is a problem. Uh, but uh, you just, what, what Russia believes disinformation is, and especially since the, this full-blown invasion of Ukraine, uh, you call it a fake and you criminalize it. So we, we're not even dealing with this. We forbid this. Yeah? And this, I think, is the uh, uh, Russian way or Putinist way uh, of looking at things and, and of looking at those challenges that this probably new modernity is bringing. I think maybe you, um, in a way, maybe idealize a little bit too much, in my opinion, this gay modernity, because it is, yes, it is about the earth, yeah, it is about, uh, about uh, climate, it is about environment, it is about how humanity actually, um, what effect it brings to, to the earth, yeah, to, to our world. But it's also not without problems, you know, it's not without challenges, this new modernity. And uh, to be, one needs to be prepared, liberal democracies need also to be prepared to deal with those challenges. 
uh, one concept that I think is a continuation of what you wrote, yeah, about Petrostate, state, this the the uh, nature's evil, uh, uh, your uh, excellent book, uh, which if you haven't read, I uh, highly recommend reading it. This better state, and we see it now. I mean, uh, the book was finished, but since then we saw, and I will ask you to uh, to comment on this. We saw that two other Petra states started wars. Azerbaijan started a war uh, with Armenia, essentially. Uh, Armenia did not really resist, but still it was a war. It was an unarmed conflict. And of course, Venezuela is now on the brink of the war of annexing uh, part of Guyana. So I will ask you um, then to, to comment on this. As for Ukraine, because in the end, you know, this book is called Russia Against Modernity, but it's in Ukrainian uh, colors. So obviously the war uh, is central to the book, uh, the war against Ukraine, Russo-Ukrainian war, as you say, I myself prefer Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, Ukraine here, yeah, probably it is not part of this gay modernity, yeah, but I think the one of the reasons uh, is not probably not necessarily uh, hatred of ethnic Ukrainians as such. It's not like anti-Semitism, yeah, where the hatred was essentially almost biological. Uh, I don't think that that uh, biological hatred of uh, ethnic Ukrainians is under consideration here, but I think the the anti-Ukrainian nature of the war in that that Ukraine decided to go to that direction of gay modernity, leaving behind palo modernity that was associated not only with Russia but probably with the with with Putinist conception of 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 the Russian world or Russian civilization, for Putin, of course, that was uh, this move of Ukraine towards the West, towards the EU, and towards all those values, even post-materialist values. Uh, again, not not uh, in unproblematic way, but still, this move in that direction posed also an existential threat. Probably also if not not uh, uh, this materialist aspect that you described about the um, the uh, oil and gas. There is another aspect: is that if Putin believes that Ukraine is part of this greater Russian civilization, and Russian civilization is a civilization on its own, it's not part of Europe, it's not part of Asia, it is its own civilization that cannot be part of any other civilization. But then Ukraine joining the, say, European project, or you know, rejoining the European civilization, the Western civilization, undermines the core argument of the Putinist system that you can't be Russian, or you cannot be you know, this uh, Russian nation, and he does not really believe that Ukraine is, is a separate nation. So you have this, uh, some strange Russian nation that becomes part of the West, and and then his his all, all this concept of of the Russian civilization is is hugely undermined. Um, I will um, yeah. So I uh, already uh, um, posed you a question about Venezuela, about the Petro state, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, one another question. What I liked about the book, uh, one of the reasons what I uh, liked about the book, is that you. Your, the book manages to zoom in and, and zoom out of the situation and looking at the war through different lenses, through different uh, uh, prisms. Uh, one particular um, lens I found very interesting, and or at least you, uh, you, you mentioned this, uh, Petro states such as Russia with, with its expansion, with its, you know, when you need to find uh, the um, uh, oil and gas, the new reservoirs all the time, and how, this is how Russia expanded, how it be became an empire, and how it became Petro's state. Uh, you note that in this process, and for Petro's state, people are not very important. You just need enough people to manage 
this oil um, um, drilling system uh, and to find gas and transport. And this is not a very huge number of people that you need. And also there is not much, in the end it's not much technology involved. You don't need to invest much into the technological advance, uh, uh, advance uh, of, these, of, of this particular work. This, this brings me to, to a question to you, which I will pose. It's a, it's a double question. So one question, do you think that this particular type of expansion of Russia contributed to the sort of, in a way, loss of, of human uh, value of human life in the Russian Federation, that you know, people are not important? We see that uh, for Putin in this war, numbers of the fallen soldiers, Russian soldiers, officers, is not very important. Yeah, he is ready to sacrifice an, uh, a huge number of people, and the, he will not stop. So do you think that you know, this, this petrostate produces this very low value of human life? And then this is one part of the question. And the second part of the question, there is also this contrast between the low value of human life, even of the Russian life, but then this fascination and excitement and the cult of the Russian world. And the, the essence of the Russian world is still people. You know, these are Russian-speaking uh, people or ethnic Russians. So how do you explain this contrast? On the, on the one hand, this uh, low uh, value of human life that that as we saw during this Russian-Ukrainian war, easily translates into dehumanization of Ukrainians. And then this fascination with the Russian world that apparently does consist of people, and then you do value uh, their, their sort of even availability in a way. So that would be my initial questions. Well, thank you very much. This, this this is very, very precise reading of my book and also very thoughtful questions, very rich questions. So uh, to, today, Mr. Putin is visiting uh, Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Emirates, and that is you know, one of his very rare foreign trips because he, you know, he's, he will be arrested almost anywhere else but in Saudi Arabia. So this, is, uh, this illustrates this, 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 this Petro states uh, love one another. You know, they compete, of course. They compete, you know. They, but they have mechanisms uh, 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 such as OPEC Plus, which center is here in Vienna, a few blocks from here, actually. And OPEC Plus, uh, that's the organization of petroleum exporting countries, which has all of them, Venezuela and, and uh, Arab countries, and... Um, uh, and now also PLUS stands for mainly for Russia. And they basically they compete, as, but they agree about prices and about quotas, and, and that's a cartel, that's a huge international monopoly on uh, oil. And they sort of, they, it's like Petro states um, of this world unite. It's like Mark said about proletariats, but proletariat, but say Putin, or, the Saudi princes, they obviously, they say the same thing about uh, this particular uh, political um, creatures, Petro, Petro states. They have common interest, and they are now under uh, equal threat, equal challenge of decarbonization. They have huge assets, all of them. Uh, most of them are sort of, you know, more, more careful or more moderate than uh, the Russian Federation under Putin, but that's, you know, this, this, uh, this obviously should be explained somehow differently. Um, but some of them go as far as starting actual wars, and that was, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Azerbaijan, another typical Petra state against Armenia. And right now, Venezuela is threatening to, to launch a war against Guyana, and uh, that's, that's really looks very similar to what Putin did against you know, Crimea and Ukraine. 
But also, and that's more kind of controversial point to make. Uh, I think that in the current conflict in, in, uh, in, in Gaza, there is a serious component connected to, pet, pet, to those petro states that financed Hamas and probably still financing Hamas. And these are Qatar and Iran. While Israel by, I mean, is, is not a petro state, so I, I, I juxtapose uh, resource dependent states and labor dependent states. Those countries, those states that make their money on the labor of their people. And if, um, if a, a state, with all its state bureaucracy, whatever apparatus, it could be bureaucratic, could be autocratic, could be democratic, whatever, uh, could be t tyrannical, but still, if, the, if taxes come from, from people, and people earn their uh, prosperity by labor and share a part of this prosperity with the state, then of course the state really depends on these people and appreciates them and sort of takes care you know, of their education, training, so that they could work well for their health, about their environment, you know, clean whatever, air, clean water, and much else. And that's the mechanism. While in a petro state where there's enormous wealth, which basically, as we see, can, you know, gets to be much bigger than whatever labor could create, um, unfortunately. So, so it, it does not need people. So oil extraction is, is not labor intensive. So in comparison with coal extraction, oil ex does not really need many people. It needs like dozens of people on the whatever oil derrick maybe hundreds of people on the oil field, but it's not like thousands or dozens of thousands that went into the mine. And that's a great uh, you know, theme, first formulated by Timothy Mitchell, the American political um, scientist. So there is a you know, serious and very productive tradition that has created it's, you know, under the idea of the oil curse, which I, I think now it's better to talk about as Pet Petro State. So yes, Petro State does not need its people, does not uh, appreciate its people, and kind of depreciates the value of human life. And we see it everywhere, essentially. We see it also. But different Petro States have different um, strategies of dealing with that. Say whatever, Saudi Arabia, they have, they have, uh, they have like stakeholders in the oil business, which is you know, very few citizens of the, of, of the state and masses of migrant labor that, you know, they are not, they have no, they are not, they have no social security, they have low wages, they are gastarbeiters. Um, and that's basically institutionalized uh, there uh, and uh, is kept informal in Russia. Now, about your, your understanding of the Russian world as made of people. I, that's interesting. That's an interesting conversation. And uh, kind of new. I, I, I think in this book I don't really talk about this, about the Russian world. It's such a, an ideological slogan. And this book is not really about ideology. But now that I'm thinking about it, I, I, I don't believe that the Russian world is made of people. The Russian world is made of culture. Language, it's like basically it's, def it's defined by, by language. Um, and like everyone who speaks Russian, they are basically conscripted to the Russian world. You know, whatever, whether they want it or not, whether they you know, give their consent. It's not about consent, being, you know, belonging to the Russian world. And so it's language and, and it's high culture, you know, like Pushkin, whatever. So the, all of those things that Ukrainians hate so much and for some reasons that they kind of are trying to explain, uh, and uh, some, sometimes it sounds very convincing to me, sometimes it doesn't sound, sound convincing to me. First of all, because so many Ukrainians, as we know very well, still, despite everything, they still speak Russian. 
know, you, you, you hear Russian uh, speech everywhere on the streets, in Vienna or in the whatever parks. And most of this, uh, most, of, most of these people are Ukrainians. They speak Russian to their children, you know, between themselves. But they, they, are, they play Ukrainians. They, they deeply feel that they are Ukrainians because uh, language does not define ethnicity or citizenship. This is what Putin, with his concept of the Russian world, was trying to do. Language defines belonging. But it does not. Actually, never in the world, neither in Switzerland, nor whatever, in Great, in the United Kingdom, you know, all, all this, those Scots, inclu including Scots, Scottish nationalists, or the Irish people, they speak English. That, you know, that has nothing to do with the, the fact that they are Scots. But this the idea of Russian world is kind of, you know, it's, it's quite a perverted anthropological uh, Construction. In fact, of course, it is a political construction because it gives a pretext exactly for what we are seeing for invasion and colonization or recolonization, reconquista. Thank you. I, I will come up with a, a very brief uh, uh, follow up question and then we will, we will open uh, the floor to the audience. Um, well, I actually agree, I can agree with you that the Russian world is not about people, although he himself says that it is about Russian speaking, you know, these are compatriots, you know, he's using this word. So apparently, at least formally, uh, there is some value to, the, to those who comprise uh, this Russian world, but I agree with you that in the end, it's actually... Um, yeah, it's not about it's not about people. And uh, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the some of the philosophers or at least thinkers, uh, well, intellectuals in a way, uh, in Russia, who who talked about the Russian world, uh, Shudrovitsky, uh, for example, but also uh, many other. Uh, there was even this concept of ant hill. Uh, Chelovenki, uh, no, not Ant Hill, uh, Human Hills, like Chelovenki. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, uh, masses of people, where individuals are not very important, but the the this conglomerate of people is important. It is sort of, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, the 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 uh, the comparison was with Ant Hills, so you can also have these humans. Uh, where humanity is not important, but the but the concept, the 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 idea of a civilization, is very important. But a follow up question, and here I want you to take on your another hat of yours that you have. Um, I think it was probably not even mentioned that you're also a historian of psychoanalysis and psychiatry. So I want you to put on this hat, and. Uh, Talk a little bit about one aspect in your in your book that you also describe the uh, the conflict between generations. And uh, do you see that there is a probably a, a psychoanalytical aspect uh, to this war between between a very old person? I would say I think it's fair to say that Putin is old, right? Yes, uh, I hope I, I, <laughs> That's I, hope fact. I haven't offended. Uh, 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 many of you, um, and then Zelensky, who is my age, um, so he's in these uh, what uh, mid years. Is there, any, in your opinion, you can speculate? Is there any psychoanalytical aspect to what is happening, at least uh, uh, with this uh, uh, generation gap? Yes, there is. So my first book was called uh, uh, Eros, of the, "Eros of the Impossible: uh, The History of Psychoanalysis in Russia," and it was published. In 1993, it's been republished and republished, and just this year, the, the fourth edition has been published. In, in, in Russian language, it was, it's also available in German and in English and French, etc. So I'm very proud of this book, but uh, frankly, I, sort of ch ch I have changed my sort of methodology so many times, and, and keep changing it and uh, enjoy it. Um, but indeed, uh, the problem of generation, of course, is very, uh, 
analytical one, psychoanalytical one. And I basically uh, write about that. Uh, so the current Ukrainian leadership, they could be, uh, you know, they could easily be sons of the current uh, um, Russian leadership, I, I try to do kind of social science, you know, uh, calculating average age of the members of the cabinet, you know, and uh, this, things like that. And it's, you know, it's a huge difference. Uh, one, just one example is that um, the current <laughs> Russian Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, in uh, 1991, when, the, when his country disappeared, was of the same age as the current minister, Ukrainian minister of foreign affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, was a year ago in, you know, when, when the war was launched, 2022. So this, two, this, this truly two different generations. And the uh, generation is not just about age, generation is about historical, historical, historical experience. So the, there are decades and decades which the living generations perceive as like empty, nothing is going on, but there are also you know, wars and revolutions when, which change, which force generations to change very rapidly. Not every, not every like 20 years, but maybe like every 12 years or something. And uh, of course this experience of 1991 and all this post-Soviet transformation was a huge, huge uh, formative really life-changing experience of all of them. And that separates these two generations. So basically at some point I say that this is like an uh, Oedipal conflict, uh, kind of rebellion of sons against, against the fathers. But then a critic said, but it's actually more like a reversed rebellion, uh, re reversed Oedip Oedipal conflict because that was the fathers who started war against their sons. So it's like a reversed Oedipal conflict. The opposite process, which from the psychoanalytic perspective is a kind of uh, a strange thing, actually. Well, Cronus devouring his son is... <laughs> yeah. uh, it's an example. Archetype, in a way. Uh, but it's not a typical, not a typical Oedipal conflict. Yeah, but uh, the issues, you know, between generations, they of course are, are crucial for this book, and also, uh, and that interacts very interestingly with the issue of gender. So uh, that's about males, females, and life expectancy their life expectancy. So an average man in Russia dies 12 years earlier than an average woman, 12 years earlier. This basically is a half of generation, 12 years. So the, the older, like demographically, the older you are, say, as a man uh, in Russia, the more women you see around you, and the less men, the less of your peers you, you see. So that in the, uh, say, in Putin's generation, like for people of, of over 70, there are two females per one man. And um, I sort of, uh, I was trying to build my own kind of uh, myth, my own big story out of this difference, basically I say that a typical Russian family um, consists of a, um, of a grandmother whose um, partner has died or, or is away anyway, because there is also the record number of divorces and all that. But most probably that's lonely grandmother a lonely mother who is also a breadwinner for the family because her husband is away or dead. Maybe he pays alimony, but the rate of paying alimony is also record, very, very low in Russia. 
there is statistics on that as well. So she, so the mother is breadwinning, and she is taking care of the children. But of course, she cannot do it. So the grandmother is the actual educator of one or two children because the fertility is also very low. So just one or two children. So grandmother, mother, and uh, children of both genders. So the mother is working very hard because she is basically feeding the whole family. And uh, therefore, the, uh, all this upbringing process is taking place between the grandmother and the grandchildren, which skips the generation of the parents. Which, and that's my kind of contribu <laughs> contribution to the subject, which slow downs any cultural change, any cultural transmission. Because the, the, it, it, it needs twice as long to pass any kind of new idea, whatever cultural innovation, it could be whatever. Say contraceptives or tolerance or uh, dealing with uh, waste and garbage, things like that. Internet skills. So if it comes from the grandmother to the grandchildren, it takes twice as long you know, time for the grandmother to acquire and to pass it than, uh, you know, for, uh, that, that, than for a regular nuclear family. This is not really psychoanalysis, but something close to it. Um, I will open now the floor to the uh, to the audience, but uh, just a very short remark. Actually, this combination of gender and age is a very interesting. Also, uh, this prism mm -hmm. looking at what you say: this uh, the paleo modernity and the gay modernity and gay modernity. Uh, this conflict, and uh, you know, I have this little game on uh, on Facebook sometimes. Every time I see some random criticism of, especially vicious criticism of Greta Thunberg who is a not unproblematic uh, representative of gay modernity, uh, I go and check, and usually it's three things. This vicious critic of Greta Thunberg will be male, white, and in their 40s and 50s. So this, and this is a really typical critic of Greta Thunberg. So this, you know, uh, gender and age, uh, this, uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, let's uh, have questions. <laughs>